since now I shall be taken from you. I, Henry V, King of France and England, render thanks to God that he calls me when I am a perfect remembrance. This I say, my brethren and loving friends, if you love me, you ought to love my child, not for his desert, but for mine. I charge you all to render your allegiance unto my son, King Henry VI, as touching the estate of my realm. I command you to love and join together in one league and one unfeigned amity. I will that my brother Humphrey shall be protector of England during the minority of my child. And I command Lord Talbot with fire and sword to persecute Charles, calling himself Dauphin, to expel him utterly from our realm of France. What I have gotten, I charge you to keep it. I command you to defend it, and I desire you to nourish it. Heavens with black, yield day to night. Comets importing change of times and states. Brandish your crystal tresses in the sky, and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto Henry's death. <laughs> King Henry V, too famous to live long. What shall I say? His deeds exceed all speech. He never lift up his hand, but contrary. You were the king blessed of the king of kings, the battle of the Lord of hosts he fought. The church's prayers made him so prosperous. The church, where is it? Had not churchmen prayed, his thread of life had not so soon decayed. None do you like but an effeminate prince, who like a schoolboy you may overawe. Gloucester was very like, thou art protector, and lookest to command the prince and the realm. Cease! Cease these jars and rest your mind in peace. Henry the Fifth, thy ghost I invocate. Prosper this realm, keep it from civil broils. A far more glorious star thy soul shall make than Julius Caesar. My honorable lords, help to you all. Sad tidings bring unto you out of France of loss, of slaughter, and discomfiture. Guyenne, Compiègne, Rouen, Rheims, Orleans, Bordeaux, Guichard, Poches are all. No treachery, but want of men and money. Amongst the soldiers, this is muttered, that here you maintain several factions, and whilst the field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing amongst your generals. Awake, awake, English nobility! Let not sloth dim your honors, new begot. Cropped are the Florida looses in your arms. Of England's coat, one half is cut away. The English army is grown weak and faint, and brave Lord Talbot craveth fresh supply. Remember, Lord, your oath to Henry Sworn. Either to quell the Dauphin utterly, or bring him in obedience to your yoke. I'll turn the tower with all the haste I can, to view the artillery and munition, and then I will proclaim young Henry King. Tell the Moli where the young king is, be ordained his special governor, and for his safety there I'll best devise. Each has his place and function to attend. I am left out. For me, nothing remains. Gloucester would have the armor from the tower to crown himself king and suppress the prince abominable Gloucester. Cut thy head, for I intend to see thee dead. <laughs>
Athenians then suffer, say, I maintain the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the end. Faith, I have been true unto the law. I never yet could bend my will to it, and therefore bend the law unto my will. Till you, my lord of Warwick, though between us. Oh, in all these nice sharp courts of the law of good faith, I am no wiser than at all. <laughs> Since you are confined and so loath to speak, in dumb significance, proclaim your thoughts. Let him that is a true-born gentleman, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar, pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward, nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. Mm. I love no color, and without all color, a base, insinuating flattery. I pluck this white rose with contact. <laughs> Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. <laughs> and I, then, for the truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale <laughs> and make it ah! Give me my verdict on the white rose. <laughs> Prick not your finger as you pluck it off, lest the bleeding do paint the white rose red and fall. Oh, 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 Somerset, where is your argument? Yes, in my scabbard. Meditating that shall dye your white rose of bleeding red. <laughs> Meanwhile, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses, for pale they look with fear, as witnessing the truth on our side. Uh, no, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger, that thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses. <laughs> and yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Hath not thy rose a canker, Somerset? <laughs> <laughs> that shall maintain what I have said is true. <laughs> now, by this maiden blossom in my hand, I have scorned thee and thy faction, peevish boy. Away, away. We grace the yeoman by conversing with him. Now, I got to dwell that wrong to you, son of His grandfather was Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son to the third ever king of England. So he pressed the yeoman from so deep a root. Was not thy father, Richard, Duke of York, for treason? Executed in our late king's day, and by his treason standest not thou attainted. My father is a catcher, not attainted, condemned to die for treason, but no traitor! And I'll prove that on better men than Somerset. Look to dwell, say you are well warned. Oh, thou shalt find us ready for thee still. And there was by these colours will I close, for these my friends, in spite of thee, shall wear. And by my soul, this pale and angry rose, as cognizant of my blood drinking age, will I. Whatever in my faction wear, till it wither with me to my grave, or flourish to the height of my degree. Go and be choked with thy ambition, and so farewell until I see thee next. How with thee, Suffolk? Farewell, ambitious York. How I am brave to muster forth and endure it. Now, give me leave to satisfy myself by craving your opinion of my title, which is infallible to England's crown. Sweet York, begin. And if thy claim be good, then Warwick is thy subject to command. I claim a right by birth and parentage. For by my mother, I derive that from Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the third son right. to King Edward the Third. while Henry, from John of Gaunt, doth trace his pedigree, being but four of that heroic life. So, if the issue of the elder son succeed before the younger, I am king. What plain proceedings is more plain than this? Henry doth claim the crown from John of Gaunt, the fourth son. Your claims are from the third. And so, in signal of my love to thee, will I upon thy party wear this rose. My heart assures me that the Earl of Warwick shall one day make the Duke of York a king. And Warwick, this I do assure myself. Richard shall live to make the Earl of Warwick the greatest man in England but a king. <laughs> <laughs> and here I prophesy this brawl today, grown to this faction in this temple garden. 
Well, one day sent between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death in deadly night. Ah, oh, come back to the dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. Stay, sir. Darest thou contain the former words thou spakest against my lord, the Duke of Somerset? Rather, for thy honor as he is. Why? What is he? As good a man as your. Are ye not so? Let's be deaf. Good cousin, cousin, you are in Somerset. Quiet yourselves, I pray, in peace. 
Let his dissension first be tried by fight, and then your highness shall command a peace. The quarrel touches none but us alone. Betwixt ourselves, let us decide them. A prisoner of the earth, Are you not ashamed? We think it modest, clever as outrage to trouble and disturb the king and us. And you, my lord, we think you do not well to bear with their perverse objections, much less to take occasion from their mouths to raise a mutiny betwixt yourselves. Let me persuade you. Take a better course. It grieves his highness. Good my lord. Good Let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason if I wear this rose that anyone should therefore be suspicious. I'm more inclined to Somerset than York. <coughs> both are my kinsmen, and I love them both. Cousin of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in our realm of friends. Now that my lord of Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with, with his bands of foot. Go cheerfully together and digest your angry you must power. Decide. You must decide. Dissension thrown betwixt the peers burns under feigned ashes a forged love, and will in time break out into a flame. Now I fear that fatal prophecy, which in the time of Henry V was in the mouth of every sucking babe, that Henry Bourne and Monmouth should win all, and Henry Bourne and Windsor should lose all, which is so plain, Exeter doth wish his days may finish ere that hapless time. <laughs> life as 
sufficient supply of horsemen that were levied for this siege. I now let Tolbert to expect my aid, and I am routed by a traitor villain and cannot help the noble chevalier. God help him now in this necessity. If he must carry farewell wars in France. The princely leader of our English throne, spurred to the rescue of noble Talbot, who now is girdled with the waist of iron and hemmed about with grim destruction. God, that Somerset, who in proud heart denies my horsemen were in Talbot's place, then would we save a noble gentleman by forfeiting a traitor and a coward. Send some sucker to the distressed lord. He dies, we lose. I break my warlike word. We mourn, France smiles, we lose. Then gain ye get all along of this foul traitor, Somerset. God, take mercy on brave Talbot's soul. And on his son, young John, who two hours since I meant travel toward his warlike father. The seven years did Talbot not see his son. Now they meet for both their lives are done. Makes a farewell. No more my fortune can, but curse the cause I cannot help the man. Then what? But here in tools are one away. Your more of Somerset and his delay. Thus, while the vulture of sedition feeds in the bosom of such great commanders, sleeping neglection doth betray the loss, the conquest of our scarce cold conqueror, that ever living man of memory, Henry the Fifth. While they each other cross, lives, honors, lands, and all hurry to loss.
rage of heart, shuddering Megan from my side to start. Into the clustering battle of the French, and in that sea of blood, my boy did drench his overmounting spirit. And there died my Icarus, who lost him, <laughs> his pride. Oh, and his young talent, and his belly. <laughs> Triumphant death, smeared with captivity, young childhood's valor makes me smile at thee. Oh, thou, whose wounds become heart free for death, speak to thy father and thy little son for everything. My spirit can no longer bear these horrors. Soldiers, I do. I have what I would have. Now my old arms are young John Talbot's grave. Sweet madam, give me hearing and a call. Tush, women have been captivated there now. Lady Webber, talk you, sir. I cry you mercy, keep but quit for quo. <laughs> Say, gentle princess, would you not suppose your bondage happy to be made a queen? To be a queen in bondage is more vile than is a slave in base civility, for princes should be free. And so shall you. I'll undertake to make thee Henry's queen to put a golden scepter in thy hand, to set a precious crown upon thy head if thou wilt condescend to be my what? His love. <laughs> <laughs> I am unworthy to be a Henry's wife. No, ma'am, dame, I am unworthy. And who will so bear a day to be his wife? How say you, Margaret, are you so content? And if my father please, I am content. I'll let you confer with him. Farewell, sweet madam. But hark you, Margaret. No princely commendations to my king. Such commendations as become the maid, a virgin, and be his servant, say to him. No, madam, I must trouble you again. No loving tokens for his majesty. Yes, my good lord. A pure, unspotted heart. Never yet taint with love I sent to king. And this withal. presume to send such peevish tokens to a king.
Solicit Henry with her wondrous praise that may bereave him of his wits with wonder. For so my fancy shall be satisfied and peace established between these realms. Margaret shall be queen and rule the king, but I will rule both her, the king, and realm. is this, they humbly sue unto your excellence to have a godly peace concluded of between the realms of England and of France. And that's a great technology. Well, my lord, and as the only means to stop effusion of our Christian blood. I marry, uncle, for I always thought it was both impious and unnatural that such a majesty of bloody strife should rule among professors of one faith. Your wondrous rare description of our Earl of Beauteous Margaret hath a and what is more, she is not so divine, so full replete with choice of all delights, but with the humble lowliness of mind, she is content to be at your command, command I mean a virtuous chaste intents, to love and honor Henry as her lord. And otherwise would Henry ne'er presume. Therefore, my lord protector, give consent that Margaret may be England's royal queen. So should I give consent to flatter sin? You know, my lord, your highness is betrothed. I'm to another lady ever seen. How shall we then dispense with that contract and not deface your honor with reproach? As doth a ruler with unlawful oaths that therefore may be broke without offense, a poor earl's daughter is unequal. Oh. Why, what I pray is Margaret more than that. Oh, yes, my lord. Her father is a king, the king of Naples and Jerusalem. And of such great authority in France that his alliance will confirm our peace and keep the Frenchman in allegiance. And yield, my lord, and you can both agree that Margaret may be England's royal queen. Go, son of a And you, good uncle, vanish all things. <laughs> I humbly now upon my bended knee inside of England and her lordly peers deliver up the Lady Margaret, the happiest gift that ever Marquis gave, the fairest queen that ever king received. Something arise. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can express no kinder sign of love than this kind kiss. Oh, Lord, that makes me like me a heart replete with thankfulness, for thou hast given me in this beauteous face a world of earthly blessings to my soul. If sympathy and love unite our thoughts, great king of England and my gracious lord, the mutual conference that my mind hath had by day, by night, waking and in my dreams, in courtly company or at my beads, with you, mine all-deliefest sovereign, <laughs> makes me the bolder to salute my king with ruder terms, such as my wit affords, and overjoy of heart doth minister. Her sacred reverence, but her grace in speech makes me from wandering fall to weeping joy, such as the fullness of my heart's content. Lord, with one cheerful voice, welcome my love. Lord, it is we, Margaret, England's happiness. So it please your grace, here are the articles of contracted peace between our sovereign and the French King Charles for 18 months, concluded by consent. In premise, it is agreed between the French King Charles and William de la Pole, Marquis of Suffolk, ambassador to Henry, King of England, that the said Henry shall espouse the Lady Margaret, daughter unto René, King of Naples, Sicilia, and Jerusalem, and crown. the Duchy of Anjou and the County of Maine shall be released and delivered unto the King of... Uncle, how now? Pardon, my lord, some sudden qual hath struck me at the heart and dimmed my eyes that I can read no further. Uncle, I'm going to say, pray, we go. Uh, I turn. She is also 
will agree between the two that the Duchess of Anjou and May shall be released and delivered to the king, her father. And she shall be sent over of the king of England's own cost and proper charges without having any dowry. Oh. They please us well. Lord Marcus, kneel down. We here create thee the first duke of Suffolk, and gird thee with the sword. Cousin York, we here discharge your grace from the regent in the blood of France till term of 18 months be full expired. My lord, we thank you all for entertainment to my princely queen. Come, let us in, and with all speed provide to see her coronation be performed. See with grief the utter loss of all our realm of France. And the regret the England's kings have had large sums of gold and dowries with their wives. And our King Henry gives away his own to match with her who brings no vantages. She should have stayed in France and starved in Paris. Oh, Gloucester, now he grow too hot. It was the pleasure of my lord the king. Ah, my lord of Winchester, I know your mind. Tis not my speeches that you do dislike, but tis my presence that doth trouble you. Rancor will out, proud prelate. In thy face I see thy fury. If I longer stay, we shall begin our ancient bickerings. Lordings, farewell. And say when I am gone, I prophesy France will be lost and lost. So there goes our protector in a rage. <laughs> Tell you that he is mine enemy, nay more, an enemy unto you all, and no great friend I fear me to be. Consider, Lord, he is the next of blood, the heir apparent to the English crown. What though the common people of favor him, calling him Humphrey, good, good Duke of Gloucester. I fear you, Lords, with all this flattering gloss, he will be found to be a dangerous protector. Why should he then protect our sovereign? He being a race to govern of himself. My cousin of Somerset, join you with me, and, and all, together with the Duke of Suffolk, and we will quickly hoist this Duke Humphrey from his seat. This way, this is what offers the land. Let's see. The Duke of Suffolk presently. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And of York, though Humphrey's pride and greatness of this place be grief to us, yet let us watch the haughty cardinal. If Gloucester be displaced, he'll be protector. With our eyes shall be protector, Warwick, despite Duke Humphrey or the Cardinal. Do you as I do in these dangerous days. Wink at the Duke of Suffolk's insolence, at Beaufort's pride, at Somerset's ambition, till they have snared the shepherd of the flock, that virtuous prince, the good Duke Humphrey. Tis that they seek, and they in seeking that shall find their deaths. 
My Lord, break off. I know your mind is full. Anjou and May are given to the French. Paris looks. The state of Normandy stands on a tickle point. Now they are gone. Call you for me, for I had hopes of France. Even as I have of England's fertile soil. Suffolk concluded on the articles. The peers agreed, and Henry was well pleased to change two dukedoms for a duke's fair daughter. Well, I cannot blame them all. What tis to them? Tis mine they give away and not their own. The day will come when I shall claim the crown, but that's the golden mark I seek to hit. Nor shall proud Lancaster usurp my rights, nor hold that scepter in his childish fist, nor wear the diadem upon his head, whose church like humor fits not for a crown. What shall we wait while others be asleep to prize the secrets of the state? So Henry surfeits in the joys of love with his new queen and England's dear born bride, and Humphrey with the peers be torn in a jar. Then shall I raise aloft the milk white robe with whose sweet smell the air shall be perfumed, and in my standard bear the arm. Still under the surly Gloucester's governance, am I a queen in title and in style, and must be made a subject to a duke? I thought King Henry had resembled thee in courage, courtship, and proportion. But all in his mind is bent to holiness, to number other marines on his beads. His champions are the prophets and apostles, his weapons holy saws of sacred writ. His study is his tilt yard, and his loves are brazen images <coughs> of canonized saints. I would the College of Cardinals would choose him pope and carry him to Rome and set the triple crown upon his head. That were a state fit for his holiness. Matter be patient as I was called, your highness came to England, so will I in England work your grace's full consent. Beside our haughty protector have we bumper, the imperious churchman. Somerset, Warwick, and Grumbling York, and not the least of these, but can do more in England than the king. Ma'am, listen to me. Although we fancy not the cardinal, yet must we join with him and with the lords until we brought your comfrey in disgrace. Then one by one we'll weed them all at last, and you yourself shall steer the happy hell. or Somerset or York, all's one to me. If York have ill demeaned himself in France, then let him be denied the regentship. If Somerset be unworthy as the place, let York be regent, I will yield unto him. <laughs> Whether your grace be worthy, yea or no, dispute not. That York is the worthier. And this is why let thy betters speak. The cardinal's not my better in the field. All in this presence are thy betters, Warwick. <laughs> Peace, <laughs> uncle, and show some reason to us all why Somerset should be preferred in this. Because Madam, the king is old enough himself to give this censure. These are no women's matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he old enough for needs your grace to be protector of his excellence? Madam, I am protector of the realm, and at his pleasure will resign my place. Resign it then and leave thine insolence. Since thou art king, and who is king but thou? The commonwealth hath daily run to rack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The commons hath been racked, with its clergy back are lank and lean from thy and thy sumptuous buildings and thy wife's attire have cost a massive public treasure. Thy yeah. 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 offices and towns in France, if they were known as the subject is great, would make thee quickly hot without thy head. <laughs> as for thy spiteful, false objection, 
actions, prove them, and I lie open to the law. But God in mercy, so deal with my soul, as I in duty love my king and country. But to the matter that we have in hand, I say, my sovereign, York is meanest man to be your regent in the realm of France. Before we make election, give me leave to show some reason of no little force why York is most unmeet of any man. I tell thee, Suffolk, why I am unmeet. First, for I cannot flatter thee in pride. <laughs> Next, if I be appointed to that place, my lord of Somerset will keep me here without this dark money or furniture till France be won into the Dauphin's hands. Last time, I danced the peasants at his will till Paris was besieged, famished, and lost. That can I witness, and a follow of fact that there were traitor in the land of men. Peace and strong warwick. Image of pride, why should I hold my peace? All in it, suffer no time in such. And thy ambition, your honor, to be peace to queen, and quit not only serious fears, for blessed are the peacemakers on earth. Hmm. <laughs> My lords, accept this verdict. He is unworthy to have any voice. The Lady Eleanor, the protector's wife, has practiced dangerously against your state, dealing with witches and with conjurers whom we have apprehended in the fact. Raising up wicked spirits from underground, demanding of King Henry's life and death, and other on your right to the as more and more your great challenge. Sovereign, 
Gloucester is a man unsounded yet and full of deep deceit. My lord, as much as the care you have of us to mow down thorns that would annoy our foot is worthy praise, but should I speak my conscience, our kinsman Gloucester is as innocent from being treason to our royal person as is the suckling lamb or harmless dove. What's more dangerous than this fond appliance? Seems he had dug, his feathers are but borrowed. Take heed, my lord, the welfare of us all hangs on the cutting short, that fraudful man. All happy this is my lord the king. Pardon my lord that I have stayed so long. Nay, Gloucester, know that thou art come too soon, unless thou art more loyal than thou art, a duresty of high treason here. Well, Suffolk's duke, thou shalt not see me blush. Who is can accuse me? Wherein am I guilty? Thought, my lord, that you took bribes of France, and being protector, save the soldier's pay, by means whereof his highness hath lost France. Is it but not so? What are they that think it? I never robbed the soldiers of their pay, nor never had one penny bribe from France. That coin that ever I hoarded to my use be brought against me at the judgment day. In your protectorship, you did devise strange tortures for offenders never heard of. That England was defamed by tyranny. But tis well known that whilst I was protector, pity was all the fault that was in me. So help me, God, as I watched the night, I night by night in studying good for England. Well, hath your highness answered these charges, but my dear crimes are laid unto your charge where you cannot easily purge yourself. I do arrest thee in his highest name, and here commit thee to my good lord, cardinal, to keep until a further time of trial. My lord of Gloucester, it's my special hope that you will clear yourself of all suspect. My conscience tells me you are innocent. Oh, my lord, these days are dangerous. Virtue is choked with foul ambition and charity chased hence with rancid hands. Foul subornation is predominant and equity exiled, your highness grant. I know their convoy is to have my life. And, and if my death might make this island happy and prove the period of that tyranny, I would expend it with all willingness. Mine is made the prologue to their play. For thousands more that yet suspect no peril will not conclude their plotting tragedy. Beaufort's red, sparkling eyes blab his heart's malice. In Suffolk's cloudy brow, his stormy hate. Sharp Somerset and burning with his tongue, the envious load that lies upon his heart. And dogged York that reaches at the moon whose overweening arm I have plucked back by false accused that level at my life. And you, my sovereign lady with the rest, causeless have laid disgraces on my head and with your best endeavor have stirred up my weakest liege to be my enemy. I, all of you have laid your heads together and all to make away my guiltless life. My liege is greatly intolerant. Have he not put a sovereign lady here with these ingenious words, the clerkly coward? <laughs> Far too much spoken in it. I lose indeed. Beshrew the winners, for they played me false. Now, where's the sense in holding us here all day? Lord Cardinal, he is your prisoner. Sir, take the duke and guard him short. Thus King Henry throws away his crutch, whose all his legs be firm to bear his body. Thus is the shepherd beaten from thy side, and wolves are nothing who shall go. Remorseless have they borne him hence. 
<laughs> there's the dam, runs flowing up and down, looking the way her harmless loved one went, and can do not but wail her darling flocked. In so myself bewails her Gloucester's case, with sad, unhelpful tears, and with dimmed eyes, looks after him and cannot do him good. So mighty are his valid enemies. His fortunes I will weep, and twixt each groan say, who's a traitor? Gloucester, he is none. Free lords, cold snow melts with the sun's hot beams. Henry, my lord, is cold in great affairs, too full of foolish pity. Believe me, lords, this Gloucester should be quickly rid of the world to rid us from the fear we have of him. That he should die is worthy policy, but yet we want a color for his death. Tis he that he condemned by force of law. But in my mind, there were no policy. The king will later still to save his life. The commons happily rise to save his life. So do not stand on quillets how to slay him, be it by gins, by sand, by subtlety. Waking or sleeping, tis no matter how to be dead, tis resolutely spoke. Not resolutely, except so much word done. Say but the word, I will be his priest. But I would have him dead, my lord of Suffolk, ere you can take two mortars for a free. No, say you consent. Consent you well the deed, and I will provide his executioner. I tender so the safety of my lead. Here is my hand, the deed is worthy doing, and so say I. And I, and now we three have spoken it, it skills not greatly who impugns our dooms. Great art, from Ireland am I come away to signify the rebels that are up and put the Englishman under the sword. It sends the crit lords to stop for great to be time. The briefs that create the quick expedients that my lord of yore. Try what your fortune is. To Ireland will you lead a band of men, and while you're happy against the Irishmen. I will, my lord, so please his majesty. Why, our authority is his consent, and what we do establish, he confirms. My noble lord of York, take thou this task in hand, the return we do the false to come through. No more of him, for I will. Henceforth he shall trouble us no more. My lord of Suffolk, within fourteen days at Bristol, <laughs> I expect my soldiers. From there I'll ship them all to Ireland. I'll see it truly done, my lord of York. Now, Gorgon, ever be as thou hopes to be! Well, no, Bowes, well, tis politically done! To send me packing with an host of men, twas men I lacked, and you will give them to me. <laughs> I take it kindly. <laughs> Yet be well assured you put sharp weapons in a madman's hands. Twas I in Ireland, sir, some mighty band, a world shake up in England, some black storm shall blow ten thousand souls to heaven or hell. And this foul temper shall not cease for rage until that golden crown sits on my head. And for a minister of my intent, I have seduced a headstrong Kentishman, John Cade of Ashford, <laughs> to make the motion. I swear well he may under the title of John Mortimer. By this I shall perceive the Commons mind, how they affect the house and claim of York. I say that he be taken, racked, and culture it! <laughs> I know no pain they can inflict upon him will make him say, I moved him to those arms, say that he thrive, as tis great like he may. Why then, provide and come I with my strength to reap the harvest which that coistrel sowed. For Humphrey being dead, as he shall be, and Henry set aside.
measure of his love unto our sister Buna. Such it seems as may be seem a monarch like himself. Myself have often heard him say and swear that this his love was an eternal plant, whereof its root was fixed in virtue's ground, its leaves and fruit maintained with beauty's sun, exempt from envy, but not from disdain, unless the Lady Fauna quit this pain. Now, sister, let us hear your firm measure. Your grant or your denial will be mine. Yet I confess that often there is a stay when I have heard your kings desert or accounted my near attempted judgment to desire. Then what it thus, <laughs> our sister shall be Edwards. Uh, draw near, Queen Margaret, and be a witness that Bona shall be wife to the English king. And still his friends to him and Margaret. Yet if your title to the crown be weak, as may appear by Edward's good success, it is but reason that I be released from giving aid, which late I promise. Uh, <laughs> but shall you have all kindness at our hand, as your estate requires, and mine can be. Henry, having nothing, nothing can he lose. And as for you yourself, our quondam queen, you have a father able to maintain you, and better toy to trouble him than France. Peace, impudent and shameless Warwick, peace. Proud center up and pull her down of kings. I will not hence to with my talk and tears, both full of truth. I make King Louis behold thy sly conveyance and thy lord's false love, for both are birds of self-same feather. My lord ambassador, this letter is for you. This from our king unto your majesty. Oh. <laughs> and madam, this for you from whom I know. <laughs> Like it well that our fair queen, mistress, smiles at her news from the work, frowns at his. Nay, mark how Louis Sims, as he would never let hope told for the best. Get yeah! up! Warwick! <laughs> what have your news and yours, fair queen? Mine, such as fill my heart with unhoped joys. Mine, full of sorrow and heart's discontent. What? Has your king married the Lady Grey? And now, to soothe your forgery and his, send me a paper to persuade me patience. Is this the alliance that he seeks with France? Dare he presume to scorn us in this manner? I told your majesty as much before. This proved Edward's love and Warwick's honesty. Thank you, Louis. I here protest in sight of heaven that I am clear of this misdeed of Edward's. No more my king, for he dishonors me. And to repair my honor, lost for him, I here renounce him and return to Henry. <laughs> <laughs> my noble queen, my former birth is past, and henceforth I am thy true servitor. I'll revenge his wrong to Lady Bona and replant Henry in his former state. Warwick. These words have turned my hate to love, and I forgive and quite forget old faults and join the God because he and his friend. Ah, so much his friend, I, his unfeigned friend, that if King Louis vouchsafe to furnish us with some few bands of chosen soldiers, I'll undertake to land them on our coast and force the tyrant from his seat by war. Tis not his new made bride shall succor him. Then England's messenger return in post. And tell false Edward, our supposed king, that mere France is sending over masters to revel it with him and his new bride. Now cease what's past. Go fear thy king with the world. Tell him enough to prove that we do it shortly. I'll wear the will of Garland for his sake. Tell him <laughs> my morning weeds are laid aside, and I am ready to put arms on. Tell him from me that he hath done me wrong. And therefore I'll uncrown him ere it be long. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we go and etc. With five thousand men shall cross.
apostasies and be the false heir the word of battle. And as occasion serves, this noble queen and the prince shall follow with a fresh supply. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. But answer me one that. What pledge have we of thy firm loyalty? This shall assure my constant loyalty, that if the queen and the young prince agree, I'll join my endless daughter and my joy with him forthwith in holy wedlock banks. With all my heart, and thank you for your motion, Sally, which she is fair and virtuous. And you to pledge my vow, I give my hand. Why stay we now, these soldiers shall be levied. I long, dear Edward Ford, by war's mischance, for mocking marriage with the dame of France. <laughs> <laughs> But I return his sworn and mortal foe. Had he been enough to make a stale of me? Then none but I shall turn his jest to sorrow. I was the chief that raised him to the crown, and I'll be chief to bring him down again. Not that I pity Henry's misery, but seek revenge and ever do mockery. What think you of this new marriage with the Lady Grey? Hath not our brother made a worthy choice? Alas, you know, tis far from France. So how could he say till war had made return? Mm. Well, here comes the king and his well-chosen bride <laughs> with her brother, the new promoted rivers. Oh. <laughs> Brother of Clarence, how like you are choice that you stand pensive as if half malcontent. As well as Lewis of France, the Earl of Warwick, with so weak courage and judgment that they'll take no offense in our refuse. Suppose they take offense without cause. They are but Lewis and Warwick. I am Edward. Your king and Warwick so must have my will. And you shall have your will because our king, yet hasty marriage. So to prove it well. Uh, and ye by the rich that you offended to. Uh, I no, God forbid, I should wish them parted whom God hath joined together. I and for pity to sunder them that yoke so well together. Setting your scorns and your mislike aside, tell me some reason why the Lady Grey should not become my wife and England's queen. And this is my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis becomes your enemy mocking him about the marriage of the Lady Governor. And Warwick, doing what you gave in charge, is now dishonored by this new marriage. What if both Louis and Warwick be appeased by such invention as I can devise? Yet to have joined with France in such alliance for the more strengthened this our commonwealth can spawn and storm than any home red marriage? Why knows not Clarence that of itself England is safe, if true within itself. But the better wind is backed by France. Tis better using France than trusting France. <laughs> <laughs> Let us be backed with God and with the seas, which he hath given for fence impregnable in them and in ourselves our safety lies. <laughs> but as one speech, Lord Rivers, well deserves to have the air and tire of the Lord's sails. I hope that it was my will and grant for this once. My will shall stand the Lord. And yet, methinks your grace hath not done well to give her to the brother of your bride. She better would have fitted me, Lord Clarence. But in your bride you bury brotherhood. Alas, Lord Clarence, is it for a wife that thou art malcontent? I will provide thee. In choosing for yourself, you have shown your judgment, which being shallow, you shall give me leave to play the brother on my own behalf. And to that end, I shortly mind to leave you. Leave you a parry. Edward will be king, and not be tied unto his brother My lord, before it please his majesty to raise my state to title of queen, do me but right, and you must all confess that I was not ignoble of descent, and neither than myself have had like fortune. So as this title honors both me and mine, 
So your dislikes, to whom I would be pleasing, will cloud my joys with danger and with sorrow. What danger or what sorrow can befall me, so long as Edward is thy constant friend? And their true sovereign, who they must obey. Nay, who they shall obey and love thee too. Unless they seek for hatred at my hands. I hear, yet say not much, but think the more. Now, brother of Clarence, what news from France? What arms shall make King Lewis unto our letters? Go tell false Edward, thy supposed king, that Louis of France is sending over massacres to revel with him and his new bride. Is Louis so brave? The like he thinks me Henry. <laughs> but what said Warwick unto our marriage? Warwick? Go tell him from me that he hath done me wrong. Therefore I'll uncrown him ere it be long. <laughs> For just a traitor breathe out so proud words. Well, I alarm me, be thus forewarned. They should have wars and pay for their presumption. But say, is Warwick friends with Margaret? By gracious sovereign, they are so linked in friendship that young Prince Edward marries Warwick's daughter. Be <laughs> like the elder Clarence will have the younger. Now, brother king, farewell. And sit you fast, for I'll hence to Warwick's other daughter, that though I want a kingdom, yet in marriage I may not prove inferior to yourself. You that love me and Warwick, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, are we armed against the worst can happen? Now, but Richard, will you stand by us? Aye, in despite of all that shall withstand you, my son. And I am sure of victory. We'll march towards Warwick and his mates, for well I wot Henry is no soldier. Treacherous Clarence! How evil it beseems thee to flatter Henry and forsake thy brother. Now therefore march we hence and lose no hour till we meet Warwick and his foreign power. These news, I must confess, are full of grief. Gracious system, bear it as you may. Warwick may lose as well as win the day. Till then, fair hope must hinder life's decay, and I the rather weary from despair for love of Edward's offspring in my womb. I'll henceforth win to the sanctuary to save at least the heir of Edward's right. There shall I rest from force and fraud. Come, therefore, brother Rivers, let us fly. If Warwick takes us, we are sure to die. And would the other fling it at thy face than bear so low a sail to strengthen thee? 
And lo, where George of Clarence stands by me, with whom an upright zeal to right prevails, more than the nature of a brother's love. Come, Clarence, come. Thou wilt if a call. Come, Clarence, come. Thou wilt if Edward call. Father of war, who you what this means? Look here. Throw my infamy at thee. I will not ruinate my father's house, who gave his blood to lie on the stones together, and set up Lancaster. What trowest thou, Warwick? The Clarence is so harsh, so blunt, unnatural, to bend the fatal instruments of war against his brother and his lawful king? Perhaps I will reject this holy oath to keep that oath for more in piety. I am so sorry for my trespass made, that to do serve well at my brother's hands, I here proclaim myself thy mortal foe. <laughs> and so, proud-hearted Warwick, I defy thee. And so my brothers turn my blushing cheeks. Pardon me, Edward, I will make amends. And Richard, do not frown upon my faults, for I will henceforth be no more unconstant. Now more welcome and ten times more beloved than if thou never hadst deserved our hate. Welcome, Clarence. This is brother like. Oh, passing traitor. Perjured and unjust! I bid thee battle, Edward! Is thou dead? Yes, boy, Edward dares and leads the way. Lord to the field, St. George and Metro! of the world, the wrinkles in my brows, I will like it oft to kingly sepulchres. For who is the king, but I can dig his grave? And who durst smile when Warwick bent his brow? <laughs> oh no, my glory, smeared with dust and blood. My walks, my manners, I have 
even now forsake me, and of all my lands, there's nothing left me but my body's leg. I want this pomp, rule, reign, earth and dust. And live we as we can, yet die we must. <laughs> shining day, I spy a black, suspicious, threatening cloud. I mean, my lords, those powers that the Queen hath raised in Gallia have arrived our coast, and as we here, march on to fight with us. The Queen is valued 30,000 strong. If she have leave to breathe, be well assured, her faction will be full as strong as ours. We are assured by our loving friends that they do hold their course for Tewksbury. We'll thither straight. Quiet, courage! Hey! Wise men near sit and wail their loss, but cheerly seek how to redress their own harms. And though unskillful, why not Ned? And I, for once, allow the skillful pilot's charge. We will not from the helm to sit and weep, but keep our course, though the rough winds say no, from shelves and rocks that threaten us with wreck. And what is Edward but a ruthless sea? What Clarence but a quicksand of deceit? And Richard? But a ragged, fatal rock, all these the enemies to our poor bark. So you can swim, alas, tis but a while. Tread on the sand, why there you quickly sink. Bestride the rock, the tide will wash you off, or else you vanish at the threefold's death. This speak I, lords, to let you understand, in case some one of you would fly from us, that there's no hope for mercy with the brothers, more than with ruthless waves, with sands and rocks. Why courage then? What cannot be avoided for childish weakness to lament or fear? If it's a woman of this valiant spirit, surely if a coward heard her speak these words, infuse his breast with magnanimity and make him naked for the man in arms! Prepare, Lord, for Edward is at hand. I thought no less that it's his policy to haste us to find his son provided. But he's deceived we are in readiness. Lords, knights, and gentlemen, <laughs> Henry, your king, is prisoner to the foe. His state usurped, his realm a slaughterhouse, his subjects slain, his statues cancelled, and his treasures spent, and yonder is the wolf that makes this spoil. You fight in justice, then in God's name, lords, be valiant, and give signal to the fight! Deathman, you have read this sweet young Briton. Away with her. Bear her hence the force. Nay, never bear me hence, dispatch me here. Here, she thy sword, I'll pardon thee my death. What wilt thou not do, Clarence? Clarence, do it thou! I heard I will not do thee so much evil, Clarence. Do it, sweet Clarence! He's out of I swear I would not do it. I charge thee, bear her hence with that hard favored devil. Richard! Richard, where are thou? Yes, Richard, gone to London, all in post, and as I get to make a bloody supper. Salt with pay and thanks, and let's away to London. And see our gentle queen. 
I hope she hath a son for me. So come to you and yours as to this free. so hard. My, my lord, my lord. It was sin to flatter, good were a little better, good Gloucester and good devil were alike. Hmm. But wherefore dost thou promise for my life? Thinkst thou I am an executioner? Hast thou been killed when first thou didst pursue? Thou hast not lived to kill us out of mine. And thus I prophesy that many a thousand and now mistrust no parcel of my fear. Many an old man sigh, and many widows, and many an orphan's water standing eye. Men for their sons, wives for their husbands, parent children for their parents' timeless dead shall rue the hour. Prophet, in thy speech, to this among the rest was I ordained. I am for much more slaughter after this. Yeah! I will go forgive my sins and pardon me. What? Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have mounted. <laughs> See how my sword weeps. Poor king's death. May such purple tears always be shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. Then spark of life be yet remaining down, down to hell. Then say, I set thee thither. I that have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of. For I've often heard my mother say, I came into this world with my legs forward. But had I not reason, think you, to, to make haste and seek their ruin that usurped our right? The midwife wondered. And the women cried, Oh, Jesus bless us, he had born with teeth. So I was. Which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Then since the heavens have shaped my body so, that hell may crook my mind to answer it. I have no brother. My wife, no brother. And this word love, which great beards call divine, be resident in men like one another, and not in me. I am myself alone. King Henry and the prince, his son, are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next. Then the rest, counting myself but bad, till I be best. I'll throw my body in another room. Try it, Henry, and I say you. Ha <laughs> ha